Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask an Airstreamer is all about where to go in your Airstream. Our panelists will go over some of their favorite destinations and you'll leave today's session with some inspiration for 2022. Before introducing our Airstreamers today, I wanna to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get to work with Airstream's brand ambassadors helping to share their stories of adventure, curiosity and exploration in their Airstream. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be published on airstream.com next week alongside other editions of Ask an Airstreamer. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video later next week. To submit your questions today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. We'll do our best to answer all of your questions, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. We'll have a dedicated Q&A section at the end where we'll share a promo code for Airstream Supply Company, which is part magazine, part travel guide, and part outfitter. And lastly, there's a two question survey that will be emailed after we wrap up this webinar. We'd love your feedback so we can learn what you liked and things that we could do better at future editions. So let's take a look at what we're going to cover. First, we'll learn uh, about Tim and Brian and some of their favorite destinations. We'll go through uh, how and how they plan their trip. Actually, we'll, we'll cover that first, the, the how behind it and then the, the where, so their, their favorite destination so far. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the tools that they use to research those destinations and we'll have Q&A at the end. So great panelists today, uh, two different types of approaches to air streaming, one kind of part-time weekend warrior, another full-time. So uh, Tim and Brian will, will share their knowledge, but between the two of them, I thought the stat was pretty impressive. Lots of, lots of driving, lots of windshield time, but between uh, Tim's family and Brian's family, uh, cumulative 81,000 miles so far in their Airstream, uh, just over three times around the, the world. So uh, it's, a, it's a great achievement. Tim, I'll, I'll toss it over to you just to give us a little bit of background on uh, who you are, where you are, and, um, and what Airstream you have. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm Tim. Um, my wife and I travel full-time in our classic Airstream. Uh, she is a, a travel nurse, uh, so that's how we end up uh, supplying our finances. Uh, I end up doing um, investing, long-term investing, uh, and then we'll uh, volunteer at campgrounds um, to uh, try to pay for groceries or, or pay for the RV spot when we are working. Um, we've traveled 41,000 miles. We've seen about 43 states. Uh, basically, we've, we've missed the Midwest, a little bit of Colorado, or a lot of Colorado, and then all of Alaska. Um, we are currently wintering in Florida. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time to, to share your experience and knowledge uh, with us. Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'm certainly jealous of Tim uh, when his short sleeves being in Florida. I'm based in Ohio, where it's a little bit colder. Um, but like Chris mentioned, we are um, kind of weekend, somewhat long trip uh, warriors. We've got a mission with our two girls that you see there to get them to all 50 states uh, in our Airstream. Obviously, Hawaii is going to be a bit of a challenge. We may not have to do that one, but before they graduate high school, uh, we've done about 40,000 miles and we're up to uh, 37 or 38 states at this point. You can kind of see our, our current map in one of those pictures. And so we generally sit, spend about two months of the year in our Airstream using it really every month, but Usually we take off December or January, depending on which year it is. So pretty regular users when we can. I haven't figured out how to transition into full time, but uh, would love to love to get to that point. Well, every great trip starts with a plan, uh, and and this is one of the things that I I enjoy the, the most about air streaming is uh, this escape and the ability to wonder what's possible and where you can go and if it's scrolling through Instagram and seeing those beautiful places or even just. Uh, you know, following some YouTubers who, who do this. Uh, I, I love this process. So I'll start with, with one, one tip and it relates to even before the, you know, the current pandemic and people wanting to, to get outside even more, there's been, a, it's been tough to get a reservation in National Park. It's, it's one, especially one of the more popular ones. So just a, a quick tip and we'll, we'll dig into Tim and Brian's experience in terms of how and, and, and when they plan, but Every national park or most national parks, especially some of the earlier ones, are usually surrounded by national forests, which are great places to boondock. And so here's a, a map of Yosemite uh, and the surrounding areas. A few different national forests around there. 
I went there about two years ago, spent about 10 days in the Stanless, Stanless National Forest, which was about 20 minutes from the Yellowstone, or Yellow, uh, Yosemite Gate. Uh, didn't have to have a reservation. It was beautiful. Didn't have anyone around me. So just in terms of options, as we talk about some places, know that there's you know, more than one way to get there. And you know, to that point, both of you have similarities and differences in terms of, of how far in advance you plan and how to pick where you're going. So Tim, we'll start with you. How do you pick where to go? Is it weather, bucket list places? What's the, what's the approach here? So we try to chase 70 degrees. Um, we're like premature snowbirds, I guess. Um, we end up, we do end up hitting higher temperatures and lower temperatures occasionally. So we are kind of prepared for everything. Um, when we first started, we were actually just focused in on what our bucket list items were, what our bucket list places were. So we found ourselves zigzagging across the country a lot, putting a lot of miles on. Um, now using the weather, we end up uh, starting in Florida or being in Florida for winter, which usually ends up being um, around the uh, November um, time frame, and then we start our making our way out of Florida around March, April, with a destination in mind to hit for summer, and kind of picking our targets um, as we're traveling on uh, what we want to do. Uh, I guess at the end of the day, our travel style is kind of by the seat of our pants. Um, when we first started exploring, we actually did plan out about six months in advance, mostly full hookup campgrounds. Uh, we actually had only one time where the plan didn't really go as we wanted to. We, we tried to get through the Sierras um, through one of the mountain passes and didn't realize that those things closed down when there's snow. Uh, so we had to drive all the way around the Sierras to actually make it to our destination. Um, it was something like a 12 hour day. Um, we drove past a number of different places that we wanted to stop at, but we couldn't because we had to make that reservation. So from that point on, uh, currently, we really don't plan much beyond maybe a 12 hour window. So as we stop and pull over for the evening, we'll, uh, we'll figure out what tomorrow looks like. Um, uh, now, that being said, I guess there are occasions like you're saying, um, or, or geographic locations too, that you need to do a little bit more planning than just uh, by the seat of your pants. Um, so most large cities, we end up uh, doing a little bit more planning. Definitely when we start getting into national parks, uh, we have to extend, extend that 12 hour window just a little bit more if we want to find boondocking spots and whatnot. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, where there's a will, there's a way. We've never really been shut out of anywhere we wanted to be. Uh, we always find a spot. Now, we don't always get the primo spot. We don't always get like that best view, but uh, we definitely get into where we want to be. Yeah, there's a, a line from another one of these webinars that we did where uh, one of the Airstreamers said, said, leave room for the unexpected in, in your plan. So the ability, if you have your, your house with you, uh, it, it gives you the, the freedom to be able to, to zig and zag uh, when you need to or want to. Brian, what about you? Give us a little bit of uh, sense into your approach. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we started off uh, four years ago Airstreaming, and I think we were much more rigid planners at that point, looking for predominantly full hookup sites. We weren't as comfortable boondocking. And as I've seen our evolution go, we've shifted much more to um, a general idea of where we're going. And we'll fill in the specifics later because of that flexibility that, that you find that you often need. You know, Similar to Tim, I, I've been in the deep south and heading one location and we found horrendous storms are coming in, hailstorms, tornadoes, all that kind of stuff. And we've had to change on the fly and head a completely different direction for the night. And so we usually try to plan a general location we're going. And as I mentioned, we're trying to hit all the states. We'll kind of have a plan of which state maybe or groups of states we're going to go to. And, and we'll kind of operate with that. Now, what I will say is for, from my experience, longer trips, you can be more flexible with, you know, we've gone out for a couple months at a time before and those uh, it's much more relaxing for, I think my, myself and my entire family to say, we're going to drive four hours here and let's head out and kind of figure out where we want to stop while we're driving um, and not have such a rigid plan in mind. It gives you uh, a much more relaxed, I think, approach to the trip. But as I mentioned, we are very often week warriors or weekend warriors. And so for those kind of things, you don't have as much flexibility 
And if you really want to get somewhere neat uh, that's that can be popular for maybe a week or a, an extended weekend, you really do tend to have to be forced into that planning six months or even recently, maybe a year out uh, yeah. to ensure that you've got a, a got a plan. Perfect. So, so with that, I think it's great to, to transition to the, the destinations that you have shared with us. The format for this is uh, we'll go back and forth between Tim and Brian. There's two slides for each destination. One is a, a why behind it. So we'll, we'll start with Florida here with Tim in a minute. And then the second slide for each location is some of the, the, the tips and insights that each of you have shared from actually going and, and, and spending some time there. So uh, Tim, take us to a, the, the place that, that many of us wish we were right now wearing a t-shirt uh, as the country starts to get colder. Why Florida? <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's 70 degrees outside right now. Why not Florida? Um, so <laughs> Florida for us, um, I, I think it started our, our first uh, winter on the road. We were trying to avoid snow. We ended up uh, picking up a contract in South Carolina um, and day one when we pulled, out, pulled in, it started snowing. Um, after that, uh, the next winter, we we're kind of uh, coming through Texas and just running from a snowstorm. Um, and then that's when uh, uh, I think last year was that big snowstorm that uh, took out a bunch of uh, power grid in Texas. Um, that kind of solidified like Florida is our winter. Um, we love Florida. I actually joke with my sister too, who lives in Pennsylvania. She talks about uh, white Christmases and uh, and having that chill in the air and how beautiful it is. Uh, and I tell her, yeah, it's, it's awesome to have a 70 degree Christmas when you're in your t-shirt and barbecue shirt still. Um, it does get busy here though, unfortunately. Uh, since uh, most people know exactly where they wanna be in Florida, uh, you'll end up finding a lot of people playing way far in advance. Uh, and then they also, it, it kind of gets it more expensive the further south you get into Florida. But that being said, kind of the general overview of, of what Florida has to offer. Um, we've been here for about three winters now, or this is our, our third winter. Um, and uh, there's still so much that we need to see. Uh, Florida has uh, three national parks down around the Miami area. There's theme parks in Orlando. Uh, we could see manatees, all sorts of wildlife. Uh, there's actually like bald eagles that nest at the RV park that we're at currently. Uh, there's NASA and world-class beaches on the Atlantic coast, uh, crystal clear natural springs here in central Florida, as well as a very large uh, kind of horse country vibe. Uh, the Panhandle uh, has the Emerald coast, coast, which is just pure white sands and uh, beautiful teal colored water on bright sunny days. Um, Besides the great weather uh, that we have here in Central uh, Florida, we chose it because uh, it we're just basically two hours from just about everything. Uh, so if we want to find a new place or a new exploration uh, area, we can do that. Uh, we just swam with manatees, for example. Uh, last year we went to uh, Key West uh, and explored a little bit of uh, that area. Um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic, man. Uh, definitely worth exploring if you've never done it. Um, when it comes to food and uh, cocktails and whatnot, uh, we actually um, found that in Key West, there's, it's all about key lime pie. Um, and uh, the further south you go into Florida, there's also Cuban food that becomes uh, even more incredible the closer you get to Cuba. Believe it or not, when you're in Key West proper, uh, it's actually, you're actually closer to Cuba than you are to a Walmart, which is uh, kind of fun knowledge. Uh, we spent a good amount of time at Disney World last year too, uh, which uh, we, we really weren't expecting, but Disney World has stepped up their game and they offer unique foods, alcohol, non-alcoholic options, all on every single one of their resorts. So uh, when she took a contract in Orlando, we ended up getting season passes uh, for Disney World and just like went on our days off to walk around. We didn't even hit any rides. We'd just go get our steps in and, and try some world-class food. Um, as far as uh, RV parks uh, or boondocking in general, uh, you have on, on this little uh, picture collage here, Fort Wilderness. Woo! That's Disney World. Uh, I know I'm hyping up Disney a lot right now, but uh, it really is something to, to check out. Uh, uh, Fort Wilderness is the absolute cheapest way to stay on Disney property. 
Uh, the energy there is awesome. It's probably one of the best RV resorts that we've been to. Um, not only do they have the normal amenities, laundry and bathrooms and pools and whatnot, uh, they also will shuttle you to anywhere in the Disney property uh, via boat, um, rail or a bus. It, it really is a, a fun experience. Um, the, our favorite park for Disney is Epcot. Um, I like to call it Epicot, Epic, you know, amazing. Um, the, That's uh, it. Epicot is yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. That was my bad dad joke. Um, the, uh, uh, Epcot is, is awesome because they actually do a food and wine festival every year. Uh, and, uh, the original Epcot is a, a big lake in the middle and there's basically 11 countries on one side of that lake. And each country has food specific to that country and a beverage offering specific to that country. During the, the food and wine festival, they actually end up bringing in a lot more. So it ends up numbering around like 30 countries. So you could spend a day just listening to music, eating food and drinking. Um, we don't spend every day in Disney World because that would get really expensive. Uh, so what we actually end up doing is spending a lot of our time. Um, we've come to, to really enjoy Sun Outdoors communities. Um, it's a, a huge brand here in Florida. They have RV parks and resorts all around. Uh, it's the best resort that we found with uh, great amenities and the price is kind of right. Uh, they have an online booking option too that makes it super easy to get in. Uh, you can also call their central phone line. So if you have any issues as you're traveling through Florida, you can call one hotline. And um, if the RV park that you're looking at specifically doesn't have availability, they can start looking at their own resorts to get you into to something, uh, a next best option, I guess. Uh, Sun Outdoors is actually also using vintage Airstreams, which is kind of cool for uh, uh, some of their food offerings. So they're actually getting these uh, there's these kitchens that are uh, or Airstreams that are fully retroed with uh, with uh, commercial kitchens. Uh, they're bringing them onto the properties, and then we're also seeing them um, uh, improve their food quality, drink offerings. So again, that becomes a unique experience all in itself. Uh, we actually come to the same RV park every single winter. Uh, it's called Grand Lake RV and Golf Resort. Um, again, amenities are great. It's got a golf course. It's got a pool, a heated pool, um, and uh, uh, bocce ball, racquetball, um, all the ball sports that you could think of. They kind of do it here, and everyone gets around a golf cart. Uh, golf carts, rather. Uh, it's really, really fun. And and Tim, give us a, uh, just as far a as quick, quick disclaimer here. Um, because I know that you're yeah. you're uh, effusive for Disney World and and some of the folks uh, some of the places that you stay, uh, just for the folks listening that the, uh, uh, there's no commercial relationship or there's no affiliate program behind this. This is just your experience because I don't want people to feel like we're selling them something. Um, but just because we have a yep. lot of slides to move through, tell us some of the tips that folks should consider uh, when. Yep, absolutely. Um, so uh, the things to consider about Florida, like I was saying, um, it, it is a, a kind of uh, snowbird destination, so it does get very busy. So uh, one year in advance is what you want to be trying to plan out for in Florida. Um, again, if you're not looking for that primo spot uh, or you're okay with not getting that primo spot, um, you're, you're able to kind of get into other RV parks uh, and find a little bit of boondocking sporadically throughout. Um, it, it is a very long state. So you can get freezing temperatures still around the Panhandle area, the Pensacola area. And as you come down into um, Orlando, it starts regulating a little bit. And then when you get into Miami and the Keys, you can get 80 degree days pretty easily. And then summertime gets like very hot. So winter is definitely the time to come. As far as boondocking options go, it's kind of spread throughout the, the state. Um, you can find boondocking in Lost Coast. It's like a, the, the little uh, bend around the Florida panhandle um, into the main peninsula area. Uh, there's some good boondocking spots in there. Um, like I said, about one year in advance is, is what uh, we recommend people going for. Uh, we end up doing a lot of it local exploring and um, exploring kind of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday timeframe. Uh, and we really are able to get into a lot of places, but weekends are typically the, the hardest times for you to get in. Um, as far as connectivity goes, uh, you got good connection everywhere in Florida. You're going to have patchy spots where you have no cell phone service or uh, no uh, data, but uh, for the most part, you're developed and good to go. 
Awesome. So thank. So uh, love love Florida is a great state. Lots of uh, opportunity for folks to pick their own adventure, uh, which is which is awesome. We have one more Florida one. We're going to zoom in to Destin, Florida. Brian's going to uh, tell us a little bit about the why behind it, and then we'll follow up with some tips. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So I will I will focus specifically on Destin. Uh, while there are a ton of options in Florida, and Tim laid out many of those. I have always found that taking our Airstream to Destin and specifically to, to the beach right on the sand, as you can see in these pictures, that has just been a very, very relaxing, low stress um, style of, of camping for us. It's, it's remarkable because unlike many of the beachfront camping, which tends to be boondocking, this is full hookup. Um, and so you can find full hookup opportunities um, right there on the sand, which is kind of incredible. It, it allows you, at least allows us, uh, to extend our stay quite a long time and not worry about resource planning as much. Obviously, when you have a family of four and you're on the sand, uh, things can get messy and sandy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, the water is beautiful, uh, especially during the winter. You know, it's it's a place that uh, I find doesn't get too hot. Uh, certainly, if you're going to be down in Florida in the summer, I would I would consider make sure you have a uh, two air conditioner airstream in most cases. Um, but something that I wanted to at least drop a tip on is we're talking about Florida here. One of the challenges that you may want to consider if you're looking for kind of a winter Florida escape and you're coming from a northern state like myself, be mindful of traveling with an Airstream full of water through a lot of freezing temperatures. And so just kind of think through the planning if you haven't winterized it, you know, maybe wait till you get to a, a more acclimatized location. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out here is if you're going to be down in Destin and you're going to take my advice here and stay on one of these uh, beachfront spots, make a trip to McGuire's Irish Pub uh, there in Destin. They've got, it's a kind of a kitschy little Irish pub, but their steaks are fantastic. And they have a steak rub that's like a salt lemon, kind of a very unique steak rub that has kind of an interaction between you and two ingredients. And it is just, it's killer. So it's definitely worth the trip if you're in the area. Brian, I have to know before we go on to the next slide here. So that, that top picture of your Airstream on the beach, can you yep. hear the ocean with the windows open while you're while you're in bed or sipping on you coffee? yeah so uh, i tend to not go in the summer uh and and i like to go in the in the off season and it's maybe december january february partially because the temperature is low enough that the windows are open and you hear the waves crashing it's about 100 150 feet you hear the waves lapping on the sand and it's it's awesome awesome tell us some of the tips that we should consider yeah, so unlike uh, you know my freewheeling kind of discussion on the longer trips, this one you've got to think through. If you want to be on the beach in Destin during the winter when a lot of people are snowbirding and getting out of the cold weather, you really be, need to be thinking probably minimum six months, likely 12 plus out. If you're a year out, I would like to say, it's hard to say guaranteed, but I'd like to say you have a high confidence getting the, the site you want. Um, and again, if you're going to take the effort, these are not cheap sites. I'll be transparent with that. And so if you're going to take the effort to get there and do that, um, I suggest maximizing your time. Probably not a weekend trip unless you're close by for me. Uh, I would say it's, it's probably a week plus. Um, and, and again, to Tim's comment, Florida's pretty developed, especially the beach areas. No issues if you're remote working, cellular connections, Wi-Fi, pretty good. So let's go from uh, one end of the country in, in Florida to... Uh, not just the other end of the country, but into another country. Tim, tell us about your trip to Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is fantastic. If you guys, if it's not on your radar, it should be on your radar. That's the little bit of island or peninsula that's uh, northeast of Maine. Um, it's it's a, a fun little jaunt from Portland, Maine, uh, but it's uh, the only place in the world that you can tidal bore raft. Uh, that is, uh, there's such huge uh, tide swings uh, that they actually will put you on a boat and take you through these like six foot standing waves. So you can see that picture of us just absolutely soaked and, and just water slapping our face. Um, and uh, it's so special, it has its own time zone. So uh, it is one hour ahead of East Coast time uh, and officially in Atlantic time. Um, like I was saying, there's some things to do there. Uh, tidal bore rafting. Uh, there's a, a very fun loop uh, called Cape Breton or the Cabot Trail with a huge amount of history there. Um, or, or like I said, just hanging out at the bay. Uh, you can see that uh, photo in the, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen is us on the, the uh, Bay of Fundy uh, enjoying those 40 foot tidal swings. Just let the water kind of uh, rise up around you and, and uh, recede out. Uh, Digby is also there um, for some fresh scallops. 
So you could, if you like seafood and you like scallops, it's uh, world class. And uh, actually, most of the world scallops come from Digby, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, Halifax also has some history. If you guys uh, like history, uh, that's the the major town in Nova Scotia uh, or city rather. Uh, it uh, has a very very colorful history tied to the United States, uh, as well as a, a major point in the Titanic story. Um, the the special thing for us on Nova Scotia, it's the first place that we saw a moose, um, and uh, so we love that. Uh, we also uh, learn to um, find and look out for little places. So we actually found this little fishing village that we're um, stopping to uh, refuel and resupply at. Um, and it's, it's the kind of place that has like the gas station is the grocery store, is the post office, is the recycle center, is the bakery. Um, it's a one-stop shop. And this little RV park there um, called Old Shipyard RV Park, uh, that's the one that the water comes around you. We ended up um, spending quite a bit of time there because we just loved it too much. Um, you're completely out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so there's not really any restaurants or home cooking and uh, kind of interacting with the neighbors, uh, camping at its best because you have full hookups, but uh, uh, you're kind of doing it on your own. Before we go over to the tips on connectivity, were you able to stay connected and get a, cell, a data plan there? Yeah, so um, Canada, you're, you're usually covered with um, cell phone. Uh, but data plan, uh, since we don't need to work from home, we just kind of went without data and they, they, they max you out at like half a meg or something like, or half a gig. So um, you have enough to check your email once a day and then, and then you're kind of cut off and slowed down. So um, cell phone service is uh, good all the way around, but data is definitely a struggle when, when we're in Canada. Got it. Makes sense. T take us through some tips. Yeah. Yeah. So the tips is, uh, always stop and talk to some of your locals. Um, so Canada specifically does their lobster licenses a little bit differently. And through talking to locals, we ended up uh, realizing that uh, our neighbor at the campground knew one of the lobster fishermen. Um, so we ended up going one day, uh, knocking on some random house um, and uh, they sold us some lobster. Uh, that lobster was $7 Canadian and the exchange rate was like $5 American at that point. So um, super fresh, uh, amazing seafood. Try to avoid uh, peak season if you can, since it's so far north, uh, the peak season is July and August. Um, so although we didn't uh, really have a ton of plans, uh, we kind of learned by the, seat, uh, by, by the seat of our pants again. Um, we, we ended up uh, being about a month out because we slowed down, not realizing that there's still a lot of ice uh, and cold weather in the northern uh, latitudes. Um, so I think we slowed down around Portland, Maine. Uh, that was like beginning of May um, because June 1st is when Nova Scotia's RV parks start opening up. So you have a 30 day window really uh, to sneak in there. You have the whole peninsula to yourself, very little traffic. Once um, that peak season, that summertime started coming around, uh, that's when we ended up shooing out away from Nova Scotia um, and getting back into the States only because we just couldn't find any other options. Um, as far as like boondocking goes, um, we didn't really have any boondocking options or we didn't look very hard, but Walmarts were perfect to start at one side of Nova Scotia and just work your way all the way around the peninsula. There's always a Walmart like every 200 miles or something like that or 150 miles so made it for easy day trips and just kind of touring around and and checking out everything um i'd say stay for a couple weeks because it's so far out um it ends up being about an eight hour drive um to get from portland maine into canada um to get to nova scotia uh once you're into nova scotia or i'm sorry once you're into canada you have an option to keep on driving around to get to Nova Scotia, or you could take a ferry to, uh, uh, to Digby uh, from St. John's. Uh, we ended up doing the ferry because we knew that we were going to drive out. Um, the uh, campground, uh, as I was saying earlier, that we stayed at was uh, Old, Ship, Old Shipyard Beach RV Park. Uh, it's our favorite place, and we ended up staying there for about a month. It was great. Awesome. Uh, Brian, I'm going to have you uh, take you to take us to Wyoming. 
Uh, this is one of the places that's on the top of my list as well. Have not yet been, so tell us about Grand Teton. Yeah, Grand Teton is, is spectacular. The whole area is just filled with amazing hiking and wildlife. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of, so it's just north of Yellowstone, um, but it's not, to me, it's not as busy as Yellowstone. Yellowstone can get incredibly busy. This still has a little bit of wide open spaces with, with nobody around in some areas. Um, we, in the top left, the picture there is a campground that I would highly recommend. It's uh, Gros Ventois uh, or Gros Vent. I can't remember how they pronounce it. It's a, a French Native American kind of mixed word. It's one of the U.S. Park Service's um, primitive camping areas. There are some sites with electric and potentially water, I think. My recommendation is to stay to the west end of that campground where you have literally views of the Tetons uh, right in front of you. It is boondocking, and so you need to be mindful of that. Um, and so I would say if you're going to get a spot out there, um, you know, probably stay a little bit longer, uh, I guess, as long as you can um, with boondocking. You know, it is, um, it is one of those places where you can get very up close with moose. Uh, and pro tip, be careful of moose. They look cute and fun, but they are actually uh, quite dangerous, more so than bears. So uh, while you'll see them, I would suggest staying a, a bit uh, distant and maybe take pictures. So. And how about some uh, some tips? Yeah, th this can be especially as we've seen the the adoption of, of RVs in the last you know twenty months or so. This can get pretty busy. Um, you can you can find opportunities to sneak into some of the boondocking sites with the National Park Service there, similar to Chris's recommendation before that are just outside. That's a great place if you want to go and you haven't planned. If you want to be in the park and get kind of the primo spots you really kind of need to think to book out as soon as the, the national park websites will let you reserve a site. Um, but also be mindful of, it's a very snowy area and the weather is going to kind of dictate when you can and can't be there. If you want to really, you know, it's great skiing area, but towing a travel trailer in heavy 18 inches of snow, I'm not sure is ideal for most of us. So I would focus kind of June to September, uh, maybe into October, you'll still be a little bit of ahead, ahead of the heavy snows. Um, but that's probably the best area to go. And then the one drawback you really need to be cognizant of is there is virtually no connectivity out there. It's, it's really spotty. You can drive about 20 minutes, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, depending on where you are, to Jackson, Wyoming, which it's a fantastic town. Tremendous food and, you know, gourmet ice cream and all kinds of really cool stuff to see. Lots of connectivity. Uh, but out in the National Park, it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit tough. So... Thanks for the, the good advice there. Tim, to continue our theme of beautiful areas of, uh, of North America that have mountains, tell us about Banff, Jasper, and the Canadian Rockies. Banff and Jasper um, and the Canadian Rockies, fantastic. Um, all the outdoor stuff that you can imagine, hiking, biking, um, glacial melt, uh, wildlife viewing. It's where we f saw our first wild bear too. So special place in our heart there. Um, we love the Canadian Rockies. Uh, it's beautiful all the way around. Lake Louise is the one that everyone knows about in that Banff area. Uh, it's especially busy, uh, but beautiful place to uh, sit out and um, have lunch, have a cocktail, get a walk around the lake um, and uh, really enjoy your time there. Um, the uh, our favorite thing that we did when we were in the the uh, Banff area is uh, we kind of treated ourselves to the Fairmont Hotel and a um, uh, little tea time. So they bring out little sandwiches and crumpets and everything. Uh, you get to just watch the lake. It was it was fantastic. Um, as far as uh, tips for Canadian Rockies go, um, this. Uh, next slide, that picture right there, that's kind of the inspiration that we had to get up to Banff. Um, that was like one of the first pictures we saw when, uh, when we first hit the road and it was like, let's find this place. Um, we didn't do much planning. We just left from Southern California and, and started driving and eventually we found that place. Um, the peak season there is also in that, uh, that uh, July, August timeframe. Uh, maybe even June. So we ended up going up there late May uh, and just continuing our way up north. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, precaution that should be taken uh, when you start thinking about that uh, jaunt from Banff up to Jasper. Uh, it's a six hour drive, about 300 miles, zero cell service. 
uh, but it's a well-traveled road, so um, you'll you'll be in good shape. Uh, like I said, we kind of winged it this whole uh, the whole time through. Uh, very easy to do. Pick out a fresh hike every single day. Look at wildlife. Um, we we actually learned there too. The Canadian uh, Canadians have a dollar coin, uh, which is called a loony, and a two dollar coin, which is called a toonie. So you got a loony and a toonie in the Canadian world, which is fantastic. Um, we uh, ended up staying at, uh, when we were in the Banff area, we stayed at Lake Louise National Park. Uh, it is a, the trailer section. They also have a camp section. Uh, we were able to get in as a first come first serve uh, and it is dry camping as well when we're there. You fill up at the, at the ranger station as far as water goes, you dump on your way in, you dump on your way out, uh, but first come first serve, can't beat that. Uh, when we went up to Jasper, we ended up staying at uh, the Whistler campground in the Jasper area, which was a, a great easy ride, bike ride from the campground into Jasper proper. Um, both places, you do need a, a vehicle. Uh, if you go up with no snow, uh, you don't need four-wheel drive. Uh, both places end up being snow or, or uh, ski resorts as well um, during the the winter season so uh pick your time of year if you want to go we like summer though tim just a quick follow-up uh you recommended saying for two weeks a week or two because of the border crossing is that just kind of effort getting into another country or any other uh insight there sir um yeah I, I, anytime we cross the border we try to stay longer than a week um, cause there, there's a little bit more that goes into border crossings. Uh, you, you can only bring across certain things. Um, so you, we end up like purging our fridge, for example, cause we don't want them rummaging through all of our food and supplies. Um, so we go up almost empty, um, and then kind of resupply from there. Uh, we know personally that what we have on hand as far as clothing is a week, food is usually a week. Um, so we try to go through a couple cycles of just average living, um, and, uh, and yeah, we, we did find out on this trip too, Chris, that, uh, you need a reason to come back into the United States. Uh, Canada might not let you in if you're not working and you have no, uh, exit plan for, for Canada. Yeah. So, uh, plan, plan accordingly. Good, good advice. And Brian, I had the chance to, to go to this next destination and spend some time, uh, in the, uh, the UP as, uh, folks in Michigan call it. So, Tell us about the Lake Michigan shoreline and uh, and why you like it. Yeah, for me, this is this is similar to, to Tim's first comment about Florida. There are just too many specific locations for me to pick one. Um, if you haven't been, Lake Michigan is, is a gorgeous lake. Um, there are many other lakes even alongside the coastline um, that's that's really just spectacular waters. Looks like the Bahamas, clear, sandy. Uh, pristine and even uh, Lake Superior up in the Upper Peninsula is is fantastic. It's it's picturesque, um, beautiful scenery. It's it's can be somewhat spread out. It doesn't have to be very crowded. There are some areas I think the further south you tend to be in Michigan, the more crowded things tend to be just because of population. Um, and so you know Holland, Ludington, Traverse City, those are great locations. They can get a little bit busier if you go to the Upper Peninsula. Um, it can be even, you know, even more spectacular, to be honest with you, but um, it's going to be a little bit more limited in terms of amenities. Um, it's will be more prepared to find those those off the trail boondocking sites and, and maybe go without cellular connectivity. And, and then what about some some tips that folks should consider? Yeah, so, you know, honestly, it, it's going to vary depending on where you're going to go. The more amenity laden campground on the water plan out plan six to nine months out, um, whether it's the Michigan State uh, Parks website or if you go to the uh, National Forest Service websites, um, you, you just need to be mindful of when those windows open. Because it is north again, it tends to have somewhat of a shorter warm weather camping season and, and folks tend to kind of flock to these locations uh, during those months. The time to visit is really kind of June, late June through August. You might be able to sneak in September as well. It can be somewhat warm. Um, that's a little bit more of a hit or miss time, I think. Um, and that allows you to have, well, I'll be honest, for some of you that may not live up north, um, Lake Michigan is never going to be considered warm. Uh, but the weather will be warm enough that if you do get in the water, you, uh, you'll be okay when you get out. And so, um, you know, for us, I, I tend to suggest staying 
depending on how far you you come from, I would suggest staying, you know, a week if you're driving six, eight hours. Um, if you might be close uh, by, you, you could do some weekend warrior stuff with this. Um, there's a great mix of, of national park kind of boondocking places that are spectacular, as well as RV parks for those of you that are looking for the amenities and hookups. Um, cellular wise, the, the kind of the lower peninsula, pretty good for the most part. The upper peninsula, it's, it's hit or miss. The towns and maybe some of the highways have pretty good cellular. Uh, to be honest, if you get off into the national park areas, those often do not. So plan accordingly. Good, good advice. Uh, and the picture there reminds me of uh, the, the dunes there on the, yeah. it makes you feel like you're in an, another, uh, another part of the country. It's a, it's a special yep. place. It really is. Tim, take us to the, the home of Old Faithful and Yellowstone. Ooh, you must, you must be talking about Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> um, right. Yellowstone National Park, guys, incredible. Um, it is absolutely uh what everyone talks about you can be looking for bears you can be finding uh wolves uh geothermal activity hiking uh, a little bit of mountain biking not a lot though uh, world-class fly fishing um and uh, a ton of driving um like i was saying minimal mountain biking uh, due to the wildlife so you can see that picture there uh, i'm actually riding my mountain bike past a buffalo that are like i don't know 30 feet away from me, 10 yards, pretty sweet, um, but not fun if they, uh, if they charge you. So uh, be careful. Um, there's hikes everywhere. Um, one of the, the greatest viewpoints is that grand prismatic uh, with that water that's straight out of the camera, cell phone camera, and, and just a, an awesome, awesome thing. Um, uh, what's special about this place? Absolutely everything. Um, it's our favorite national park, and I think it's everyone's favorite national park that go there, um, or at least a, uh, a place that they want to spend uh, more time at than, uh, than they give normal national parks. Um, we ended up staying at the north entrance at a little town called Gardner. We stayed there for the entire time that we were in Yellowstone. Um, so we didn't really get out to um, explore other towns and experience local uh, food or beverages. Uh, we opted for uh, just walking to the grocery store and uh, liquor store and just uh, making our, our home where our home is. When it comes to um, some of those tips uh, and tricks for Yellowstone, uh, I've got a ton of them. Uh, the joking, or all, all joking aside, again, the, the driving, rather, is absolutely no joke. Um, the, the National Park is actually bigger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. So that's uh, 3,400 square miles um, and 2.2 million acres. Um, no joke. So if you can, try to um, start planning your trip a year in advance so that you can use the, the park system and get into that park um, to stay at some of those entrances that will uh, get you closer to the action. So you can actually move around in the, the national park uh, to find those campgrounds and uh, uh, it'll cut you cut back on a lot of that driving. Um, we stayed at that north entrance, like I was saying, so it ends up being like a two plus hour drive to get from the north entrance to the south entrance, uh, which is Old Faithful. Um, it, it's an easy drive, it's a beautiful drive, but as soon as you hit a bear uh, or, or come across a bear rather, crossing the street or, or a bison crossing the street, um, it's called a bison jam or a bear jam and it, it can back you up another hour. So um, all in all, it could be a six hour day if, uh, if you don't plan right. So um, do your best to, uh, to plan accordingly uh, as far as the driving goes and, and kind of looking at everything. Um, we got lucky uh, when it comes to Yellowstone. We actually ended up uh, heading towards Yellowstone um, and realizing that the north entrance was closed when we were going there. Um, this was in the middle of COVID. Um, we hung out in Black Hills, Rushmore, Badlands area, which is a, a cool spot, but let's stay focused on, on Yellowstone. Uh, we heard that the north entrance was opening up and we ended up just calling all the RV parks, just trying to figure out uh, where we could get in. Uh, we ended up staying at the Rocky Mountain RV Park. Um, and this thing is, is right in Gardner. Um, you can walk to the north entrance uh, or the town, like I was saying, 
Um, and uh, we ended up just asking them like, hey, how long can we stay? They said, we can book you out for a month. So we ended up staying in Yellowstone for a month, um, just thinking like, hey, it's taken me 37 years to get here. So uh, why not stay here for as long as I can, right? Um, uh, if you're not looking for full hookups at that uh, RV park, uh, there's also uh, boondocking available or dry camping available rather. Uh, that's at, um, uh, what was that place called? I think it was like uh, Eagle Creek Campground. Uh, just north of Gardner, uh, that's again at the north entrance. Um, we enjoyed going there during the summer um, and um, there's plenty of things to see, plenty of things to do. Uh, most people plan out two weeks. Once you hit that two week mark, you're able to kind of decide like, hey, what do you wanna do? Uh, do you wanna look for bears? Do you wanna look for wolves? Uh, and you're able to just go to particular parts of the national park to find whatever you're looking for. Um, so that's, that's uh, uh, something to look forward to if you guys can pull off more than two weeks. Uh, as far as connection goes, um, good cell service around visitor center and um, around the towns on the outskirts of the, the gates, but um, it's a national park. And uh, you're, you're talking about, again, the, the size of uh, Delaware um, and, and Rhode Island combined. So you could spend a lot of time out of cell service and out of uh, data service. Uh, uh, but the good thing is it's just a big old loop. So uh, worst case, again, it takes you six hours to uh, get back to your starting point. Um, we actually ended up uh, signing up for satellite radio uh, because there's like no cell phone, no, um, no radio, no nothing, uh, but satellite service, good to go. Tim, you mentioned uh, you know, there's, there's always something going on year round at the park. From a campground perspective, in the winter, do, do you know if there are, are either campgrounds inside the park or surrounding the park? Are they open? What's the road situation in the wintertime there? Cold and deep snow. So winter time, from what I understand, is um, uh, it could get negative 20 in some of those valleys. Um, and uh, all camping conditions, as a result, um, are, are dry camping, no hookups. Uh, you're going to end up uh, uh, just being in extreme freezing conditions. It's possible, uh, especially in a in a trailer um, like an Airstream. It's possible, but uh, uh, I like Florida during the winter. <laughs> there's a there's a question specifically uh, on this topic. So Brian, I'll 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 toss it over to you. Kind of similar question, um, but Andrew says uh, he you know he's also from the Midwest. He's in Michigan and typically puts his Airstream away in November. And doesn't really take it out again into the spring. So, I'll uh, we'll drop a link to an ask an air streamer that we've done. I, I think one or two of them on winter camping. So I'll just put it in the chat as a as a resource. But Brian, I know that you use your airstream in the in the winter. What's some some things that uh, that folks should consider? Yeah, I think the biggest thing to consider obviously has to do with winterization. I found that the furnaces and airstreams have been able to keep us very comfortable down into the 10 degree range uh, easily, uh, really no, no concern there. The one limiter that you'll find when you're in temperatures that cold is propane becomes a very scarce resource. You will be clipping through those propane tanks uh, in a matter of a couple days. Uh, so be wary of that. Don't think you're gonna go boondocking in very cold weather and, and spend a week with two 30 pound propane tanks. You, you gotta plan for some extra. Um, the biggest thing that I would suggest is be very careful of the winterization status of the trailer. I, I find if you're going to do winter camping, you might be wise to get like a portable air tank that you can bring, travel with your trailer winterized. Obviously, be careful of the road conditions because they can get they can get challenging. Um, go to the water pump and get water through the lines. And when you're ready to leave, uh, drain the water and uh, hook up the air compressor or the air tank to your, your hose hookup um, and kind of blow the water out of those lines. That way you can travel. Especially the vulnerable piece to me is the outdoor shower area. That's the first place you'll see some problems freezing up. So if you kind of just pay attention to those things, winter camping can be really, really cool in an Airstream and, it, and it's doable. I, I'm in the Seattle, Seattle area and there are a few of the ski mountains locally that uh, allow you to actually camp in the parking lot. It's, it's not glamorous, but you're surrounded usually by mountains and snow. And there have been some instances where there's been enough snow in the parking lot that I can just ski right to the Airstream, which is 
Fantastic. Uh, so, so good, good, good tips there. And especially some of these places that are, are more North, um, it gets colder earlier than you think. So take a look at some of the average temperatures by month there uh, as you're planning your trip. And Brian, I'm going to have you uh, kind of round us out here in terms of the, the last uh, place. We have some, some other tools and resources that we'll carry on the discussion to the top of the hour here. But tell us about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Yeah, let's stop thinking about the cold here and go somewhere that's warmer. You know, the Outer Banks is our, our very popular kind of tourist area. Um, but I would suggest looking further south to really the, the furthest southern tip of the Outer Banks in Cape Hatteras. There's a beautiful national seashore there that offers uh, dry camping. There is access to water on the property, so you can you can get to water, but there aren't any amenities. So plan for uh, solar and, and other types of boondocking uh, approaches that you may use. Uh, it's very quiet. Uh, it's not a hustle and bustle. Uh, there are plenty of off the beaten path local seafood places around to either buy it or eat it. Um, again, these are these are much more low key under the radar, probably more geared towards locals uh, things, which can be really neat in and of itself. Um, the beaches are, are beautiful around there too. And, and the water is, is actually pretty, pretty fantastic in through October and November. And, you know, kind of a pro tip I'll say is for, I, I believe a very small amount of money. I want to say like $10, you can get an annual permit to actually drive on the beach. And so if you find yourself up on a bluff, which is the picture I have there of our, of our trailer up on kind of a bluff here, um, it's a it's a ways to the beach, but you can just take your vehicle out on the beach, bring your beach stuff, and it makes the uh, the walk down there uh, pretty easy. Just be very careful of the the kind of road conditions. It's very off roading kind of bumps, and th you know don't think you're going to take a like a, a Honda Civic down there. You'll you'll end up getting stuck. So I uh, I learned uh, almost the hard way, but letting air out of your tires to drive on sand. It actually makes the experience a lot better. So another reason to carry that air compressor. Air. <laughs> yeah. uh, as long as you pump them up. <laughs> that's right. And then you gave some, um, some background on winterizing. We've also done a couple of these sessions on that. So we'll also drop the link uh, to that in the chat too, so folks can, can see that. Tell us some, some tips about Cape Hatteras. Yeah, you know, you definitely want to reserve a spot online. This is a place that's not easy to get to because you're going to be driving down through the Outer Banks and the bridges. And it's kind of a it's kind of a one way conga line all the way down to the, the tip of Hatteras, whether you come from the south or the north, I guess, take a ferry. And so the last thing you'd want to do is get there and find out for some reason it's busy. I wouldn't expect it to be often busy again, because I think most of the Outer Banks camping you're going to find is, that's going to draw the crowds is going to be the full hookup kind of more of a premium beach offering this this kind of a national park seashore thing kind of goes towards the more uh, the more uh, you know hardcore kind of campers I think um, but if you're going to do this I would say think think a week plus just because it's not easy to get to it's a bit off the beaten path um, and but but the, because it's a little bit further south and it's in the it's in the Gulf Stream and the waters tend to be warm you can extend the season of kind of warmer weather a little bit longer than you might think. It, it can be beautiful in and through really early December in a lot of cases. Um, the only thing that I would say is, is be very careful of hurricane season. If you start getting into November, December, um, watch the weather. Obviously, nobody wants to drive into a hurricane with their airstream. So, um, yeah, the, the only other thing that I'll say is this is a spot where cellular connectivity is very hit or miss. It's not, it's not impossible. It's there. Um, folks that may have a WeBoost or other type of a enhanced communications package with their Airstream may have better success um, because there is cellular, but it's it's not great. So, just a, a quick check on the hurricane season there. I think you meant to say the uh, end of hurricane season is in November. Uh, yes, so sorry. Half, half of that free and clear. Okay. Yeah, yeah, That'd yeah. Be a terrible yeah. winter storm. To come to <laughs> yeah, right. So, but both of you uh, have inspired. Uh, me and, and hopefully the folks who have joined us today in terms of where they can go. Uh, the, the theme and everything you've talked about is freedom, flexibility, uh, and, and the ability to change your plan on, on the fly. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on, on the how behind this. So there are resources and tools that each of you use to make this easier to pre-plan for connectivity. Is it there? Yes or no? Uh, what are the reviews? So Tim, I'll start with you. Uh, talk us about, uh, talk, tell us a little bit about how you use Campanium and all saves and some, maybe some of the other tools that you use. 
Yeah, so uh, Campendium is, uh, is a great tool for trying to find uh, campgrounds and boondocking spots. Uh, the good thing about Campendium is they provide uh, cell phone ratings too um, for all the carriers. So we really love using Campendium. Allstays is a paid app. Uh, we like uh, the, the, using Allstays to find, again, greater information about RV parks. And then some of those quick overnight spots like the Cracker Barrels and the Big Bass Pro Shops, Walmarts, those are all listed on Allstays as well. Um, we like to also use that road atlas that, uh, that you see in that picture. Um, that's a National Geographic road atlas. It has all the national parks in there. And then all these like points of interest. So we found some really cool, fun spots, just kind of uh, going old school using that road atlas uh, um, as, as our guide as we're uh, traveling and, and foot loose and fancy free. I love it. Brian, how about you? What do you use? Yeah, Compendium is a great one. I'll second the uh, the tips for cellular connectivity. That tends to be really important for somebody uh, like myself who is is often working uh, remotely. And so that's great. Good Sam can be a good resource to find campgrounds. The other thing that I will suggest is a lot of the state parks have put some decent effort into creating um, different levels, but fairly functional um, campground availability uh, websites. And so you know, those aren't always kind of aggregated in every other site that you see. You may have to go to each individual state you're looking at, but by and large, I will say the majority of them have a pretty solid um, way of finding availability and, and presenting that to you. So that can be a great resource to use. Perfect. And I think two, um, you know, two, two things that I've picked up along the way in terms of places to go, talking to other campers while you're, while you're out and about has been fruitful in terms of, you know, finding that those cool places to boondock or cool places to go. And then on the connectivity side, I too am often working remotely. I'll even go as far as calling the place and be like, hey, um, is there a Verizon or at t whoever the carrier is, uh, coverage there? Just to re remove the possibility of it not working once I get there and it's time to work on Monday. So yep. other, other, other things for folks to consider. A couple of questions have come in. Um, this was coming, you know, stemming from the, the Florida conversation and maybe a tip for the, for the broader group here. John asks, have either of you stayed at any of the free camping uh, at Florida Water Management District campgrounds? Reservations are required, but they're free. No power or water at most, but dump, dump stations at some. Beautiful, remote, and free in all caps. So have you guys checked that out yet or had the chance to do that? I have not. All right. Add it to the uh, list. I I have um, specifically, I believe it was like uh, Tallahassee National Forest or uh, or State Forest um, above Tate's Hill again on that Lost Coast area. Uh, there's mm -hmm. some uh, Florida water management sites there, and and I can confirm um, they're middle of nowhere, usually uh, hit or miss on cell service again, um, but absolutely free. And uh, reservations are like same day. I think you download an app or something like that, or they have them available. Great. Uh, I'll tell you my border crossing story because uh, Stephen has a question here just in terms of what to expect. And then uh, I'll, I'll toss it over to you guys. So I was, uh, I, uh, like I said, based in Seattle, had gone up to BC and, um, and went camping uh, on, uh, up in, the, in British, British Columbia, coming back through uh, to the US. So this is kind of coming home. Uh, I get, you know, the, the, the border crossing agents like I need to see in the back sir and uh and he he pops in the back and it wasn't even like an inspection he would he he looked around was like wow this is really nice and 30 seconds later it was uh I've always wanted to see the inside of one of these things so it was less about you know making sure I didn't have any contraband but more about it seemed anyway of, of seeing the inside of the uh the airstream but Tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe a tip from you each on what to expect going, you know, in and out of this. Yeah, so I, I would say for border crossings, be mindful of the rules. Um, pets add significant complexity. Those of you who may travel with, with pets, um, be very careful to read through the rules. Often pets are very difficult to bring across. They have to be quarantined in some cases. Um, and then obviously produce and things like that can really kind of uh, kind of get you held up. So anytime you're crossing a border, whether it's to Mexico or, or Canada um, with your Airstream, certainly, you know, do your homework. Um, you don't want to get caught by surprise. I mean, certainly today we're, we're living in a uh, in a testing requirement environment. And so there's just some added complexity. So 
be be very prepared and maybe talk to folks that have done it. Awesome, Tim. What about you? Yep. Uh, we've we've had um, challenges coming both ways. Um, at, we've had more challenges coming back into the United States than uh, coming in, going into Canada. In all honesty, but um, it is when you go into Canada, um, like I was saying, make sure that you have a reason to come back to the United States um, because being a U.S. citizen isn't enough. Um, they, uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, so so have a a exit date and a a uh, kind of a route planned. They also don't, um, they're particular about boondocking. So um, you need to know exactly where you're gonna stay on any given day um, or, or precisely. So uh, just be familiar with those, uh, those provincial parks and, and or Walmarts just to make sure that uh, they're confirmed that you're not gonna be just like parking on the side of the road and, and being a slum on society. Perfect, well, thank you both for inspiring all of us on where we could go in our Airstream in, in 2022 and beyond. I've put the promo code for Airstream Supply Company on the screen, so uh, please take advantage of that. And then for folks who didn't have a chance to get their question answered today, or if you're watching this on demand, you can send an email to hello at airstream.com and we'll, uh, we'll be sure to, to find your answer. But I'll leave, it, uh, I'll leave it at that. I wanna thank both of you for sharing your time and experience with us. And then for folks who have joined us today, please keep an eye out for the two question survey.